sometimes y'all, you know, should you give positive feedback early in, in an adventure? Uh, you never know. You know, sometimes you got to maybe get a baseball bat that General Perkins talked about and swing it. But I'm going to give positive feedback. There's a lot of talking going on. So we might bump this from 10 people to 20. So if I, if I see this keeping up at lunch, we're, we're just going to raise the standard. It's going to go to you have to meet 20 people. So uh, keep it up, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll push, the, push the envelope. So I hope everyone's learning because Mad Scientist is about learning, learning about new things, challenging yourself. I know sometimes the idea of lifelong learning we hear just over and over and over again. But it is a critical aspect. Things are happening so quick. Mr. Greco often says, Lee, I really think we're starting to understand some ideas about the future. But I think what we're saying is going to happen 25 years from now is going to happen five years from now. And this is something he always challenges with. So things are happening, happening quickly, which requires all of us, especially those of us with gray hair, to learn and learn and learn. And this is what this is about. So I hope that started for you. It's only going to get better. Uh, we have some great people. The next uh, individual is Dr. David Bray. He's the Senior Executive and Chief Information Officer for the Federal Communications Commission. And uh, if, you know, if you're not following David Bray on LinkedIn, uh, add that to your homework pile. Because he does some phenomenal writing on LinkedIn uh, about the future. It's one of the ways we identified him. Also through uh, the SOCOM team who passes us as they come across great people. Uh, they pass us names and say, you need to connect to this person. Um, so add that to your homework, connect to uh, Dr. Bray. And I think he's going to prove that out as he talks to you about the future. And he leads a great panel uh, for the next hour. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. That was a very humbling introduction, so I usually like to set the bar low so I can exceed expectations, but I guess I'm now going to have to rise to the challenge. Now, uh, we're having to adjust a little bit for our time, so there is no clock in this room, which I find interesting. And of course, it's right behind me. So if someone in the back can let me know when I've got, I'm going to try and take the 30-minute talk and make it a 20-minute talk, that would be great. And if we don't have enough time, the good news is we will have a panel afterwards so we can have additional discussion. So really want to put forward to you a question, and it really is opening as a question, which is given the trends we're seeing right now, is national security still even possible in the year 2040? So we're living in exponential times. As mentioned, this is not linear. This is exponential. But let's actually put this in context. So first, who can tell me what that is a picture of? That is the Earth. It's a pale blue dot. Specifically, it was a photo that was taken by Voyager 1 in 1990 when it turned around and took a photo of our home. And it took five and a half hours for sunlight to be reflected from our planet to construct that image, and another five and a half hours for the radio waves to be sent back to construct it. So I share that because it's worth thinking about how has our world changed since Voyager 1 launched, since it took that photo to where we are today. Now, Voyager 1 launched in 1977. There were 4.2 billion human beings on the face of the planet. And for those of you who remember, the Apple II went on sale with a whopping four kilobytes of RAM at the time, which probably would not play more than two or three seconds of an MP3 file. By the time Voyager 1 had actually traveled those 3.7 billion miles to take that photograph of our planet, there's now about 5.3 billion human beings on the face of the planet. GDP has tripled. Windows 3.0 goes on sale. And in December of 1990, a young Tim Berners-Lee turns on the first web server ever on the planet at CERN. Now, any guesses as to how many web servers, just web servers, are on the face of the planet in 2017? Do I hear 10 million, 100 million, 1.2 billion, 1.2 billion just web servers on the face of the planet. And the last 350 million came online in the last 18 months. That's not linear change, that is exponential change. Now, I'm going to pause in the year 2030, sorry, 2013, because 2013, in my opinion, is when we made history and we barely even recognized it. There were 7.1 billion human beings on the face of the planet, and there were 7.1 billion network devices on the face of the planet. 
not all connected to the internet, but they were out there and could, into, in theory, be connected to the internet. A lot of them are on cell phones, but they were present. On top of that, there was about four zettabytes. How many know, how many know what a zettabyte is? A billion terabytes of data on the face of the planet. And to give you context, there are some that say that just the text holdings of the Library of Congress, just the text, is about 10 terabytes. So when I say 4 billion terabytes, I'm really talking about 400 million versions of the Library of Congress's text holdings on the planet in 2013. Now that's going to double at least every two years. So if we take those current trends, let's just go five years into the future to the year 2022. What does that look like? Well, 2022 estimates are there's going to be about 8 billion human beings on the face of the planet, anywhere between 75 and 300 billion network devices. Now, obviously not equitably distributed. They're going to be more centered in certain places, but this is the internet of everything we're talking about, when it's in your cars, when it's in your homes, when it's at your workplace, when it may even be in your body. And that's just five years into the future. Also, we're looking at about 96 billion terabytes of data, 9.6 billion versions of the Library of Congress's text holdings. Google search will no longer work. Other search, in terms of the sense that we look by keywords, will no longer work because how many of us go past the second, third, or fourth pages of search results? If you don't, you're probably going to miss something. In fact, you probably are already today. We need to start thinking about how knowledge knows what we're doing and actually says, I see you're working on this task. Would this be useful to you? Now, that's going to raise questions about privacy and similarities. When do we share that information? And do those people who choose to not share what they're doing, will they be at a disadvantage relative to those who do? And how do we do that in a workplace? How do we do that in a national security context, where maybe you don't want the machine to know what you're doing, either in the commercial sector or even in the workplace, because maybe it's compartmentalized? These are going to be huge questions just for five years. And so when they asked me to think about the world of 2040, it's like, hmm, this is going to be challenging. Now, I'm going to say this is hard because the changes are exponential. And as we know, exponential trends do not necessarily continue indefinitely. There may be crashes. We may be seeing crashes. And so these are simply projections. But actually, it was Scott Adams that said there's two ways to predict the future. One is through horoscopes and Ouija boards. The other is to take a whole lot of data and feed it into the machine. In either case, a complete waste of time. So these are simply projections, but please don't come back later in your 2040 and say, I got it completely wrong, because I would be surprised if I got it right. <laughs> so questions I want to ask you first, though, is where is a packet of information on the internet? And I think this is key. Anyone know what this is a picture of? Gutenberg Printing Press, 14, 1440. Anyone want to know what this is a picture of? It's a little light, but these are broadband connections on the internet. Now, what's interesting is up until about 2010, they were actually mapping it by geography. And then they eventually gave up because the map was so blurred, you couldn't actually see geography anymore. And so I'm going to show you that real quick. 1969, fast forward to 1982. The good news is the United States is connected. We're getting transatlantic and transpacific. By the time you get to 1993, the good news is the United States and Europe is connected. The bad news is the United States and Europe are connected. Borders are increasingly mattering less. 2007, you see they actually started to stop drawing the actual borders. And by the time, again, we get to 2014, they gave up actually showing geography. So I raise that because if we're looking at the year of 2040, I'm not sure we're so organizing by geography. In fact, I might say you're already beginning to see that on the internet. And so if we're no longer organizing by geography, what does national security mean in that context? I don't have any answers, but I can raise that question. And so we have to think about what are the other modalities that we may organize by? Do we organize by ideology? And if we organize by ideology, do we insist that everybody think the same thing we do? And does that essentially become autocracies of thought? And what does representative democracy or what does being a republic look like in that world? I think what we're seeing is a huge challenge both in terms of how you organize as a republic, but also just the speed at which you can move. Let's face it, this is exponential change. If you're a dictator or if you're an autocrat, you can capitalize on these changes much better than if you are a representative democracy, a republic, where you have a deliberative process. 
your own processes will slow you down. Now, I'm not saying we do away with them. I believe the founders were brilliant in which they said in the Federalist Papers, number 51, they wanted ambition to counter ambition. What is government but the greatest reflection of humanity? If all men and women were angels, no government would be necessary. But how do we upgrade being a republic to operate in the exponential world, or will it go away? So just to give you another sense of the size of this change, if we take Internet Protocol version 4, which is how we used to address things on the Internet, and still do for the most case, it's that octet of four numbers, that's 2 to 32 numbers. Now, we ran out of Internet Protocol version 4 numbers about 18 months ago. And now we're working to try and get people to address Internet Protocol version 6, which is 2 to 128th numbers. But if we take all the Internet addresses that you could do and put them into a beach ball, how big relative is Internet Protocol version 6 to that? If the Internet you knew is the beach ball, the Internet you're going to know in the next five years is the size of the sun. Are we surprised that we're having challenges in cybersecurity, cyber theft? This is an unprecedented change in human history, and no wonder it's challenging the public, the private sector, nation states, and the world as large. Now, the other trend that I want to put forward to is the increasing affordability of technology. And this is a trend that's worth recognizing as well, which is this happened about 20,000 20, years ago, which was we started breeding. And believe it or not, the dogs you see today are a result of human intentionality on picking which of those initially wild wolves we wanted to hang out with. This is not natural selection anymore. This is human intervention. 1865, Mendel actually looks at peas and comes up to the conclusion that you can actually start selectively breeding for certain traits and that some traits are dominant and some traits are recessive. And by how you do those pairs, you can begin to select for certain traits. So it's actually more of a science as opposed to informal breeding of dogs. 2014 CRISPR technology that allows you to begin to edit human DNA essentially like cut and paste at scale and at speed is now available. Anyone know what this is a picture of? These are all the bacteria and fungi that are part of you. In fact, there's a theory that actually we are probably less than 50% actually human as our bodies. Just like how we used to think that the sun went around the Earth. I think we'll come back later and look at the 2017 period as being quite quaint, that we thought that all you had to do was treat the human and not the bacteria and other organisms that are along for the ride. I think we'll discover that a lot of diseases we have are a result of the bacteria that are along for the ride with us as opposed to our bodies itself. Now, I raise that, though. Because if you are both your own DNA and other DNA that's along for the ride, what are we going to do in a world in which essentially anyone can essentially do it yourself CRISPR? And what does that look like? Now, in certain countries that will remain nameless, uh, poultry has tripled in body mass over the last four years. I'm not sure that's because they're feeding them more. And so that raises questions that if it's already being done to livestock, when will it start being done to humans? Now, I've seen for right now in Taiwan and other places, for about $1 million, you can actually create a custom bacteria from scratch, from the ground up. You do synthetic DNA, you insert it into an inert cell, and off it goes. That's a million dollars. Now, if we remember what happened with the internet, Moore's Law, things get cheaper and more available. So it's pretty likely that by 2040, that's gonna be widespread available to anybody. Now, let's say, Three of us go to a job interview, and we're, we're generally ethical, but maybe someone else is not. And they want to take out the competition. So they shake our hands and have a little device that begins to sequence our DNA and figure out a way that won't kill us, but just make us ill for the rest of the job interview. How do we detect that? How do we respond to it? Is that a law enforcement issue? Is that a national security issue? How do we address that? That's going to be a massive challenge. Um, I won't dive too much into this, but this was actually something I produced back in 2010. It's now unclassified, which was to gauge and assess the trend of drones, which of course, as we've now seen over the last seven years, has happened. And basically just showing how easy it is to do do-it-yourself surveillance. But I think Kondo actually has a similar story. I actually did this with some friends that were with an intelligence agency, again, that will remain nameless, where I just wanted to see how easy it was for me to figure out where they lived. So commercial equipment can be purchased for less than 100 bucks. 
do-it-yourself can actually be put together. Um, you can build your own GPS tracker. There's actually guides on the internet on how to do that. Um, so if I actually post something that's outside the facility, I'm not even in the facility, but I watch the license plates go, that gives me the license plate. In certain states, you can actually pay $15 to $20 to put a lien on that license plate, which gives you the address of where the person lives. Buy some eye in the sky, as we know, it's increasingly going commercial. Uh, you can also build them help with a very helpful do-it-yourself community. And this was 2010. And maybe attach something that's explosive to it and see what happens. And so this raises some interesting questions. So by 2040, the general trend is tactics that were only available to nation states in 2010 and 2017 will be available to individuals. And this is something that we've already seen with the internet digitally happen, which is all about personalization of one. If you treat everyone as monolithic on the internet, then your company is quickly dead. The ch challenge is, is governments cannot treat people individually. We're supposed to treat everybody equitably. If we treat people individually, that's either targeting or undue favoritism. And so this raises, again, interesting questions about how do we do our jobs when people want to be either treated personally or we need to treat them personally because of security risk. But at the same time, it's not something that's currently in our way that we operate. This is a photo, of course, of 9-11. Um, I signed up for what was called the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program in 2000 at the Centers for Disease Control. And I was a little bit of a heretic because I was pushing what was called agile development at the time. The Agile Manifesto came out in summer of that year. And people kept on saying, do waterfall, follow the three to four year plan. And I said, well, we don't have a deal with the terrorists not to strike until we get a minimal viable product out. Uh, and so was a bit of a heretic. We actually put in place some solutions before 9-11 happened. It was actually on September 11th, 2001, at 9 o'clock in the morning, when I was supposed to brief the CIA and the FBI as to what we would do technology-wise if a bioterrorism event happened. Unfortunately, 8:34, the world changed. I didn't get to give that briefing. We didn't sleep for about three weeks responding. So down on October 1st, I gave that first briefing again on October 3rd. First case of anthrax shows up 24 hours later. And I share that because I think we have forgotten the risk that bio poses to our planet. People can talk about maybe AI is going to take the world or something like that. I increasingly think bio and chem, that's the biggest concern. It's also worth pointing out this is the Mumbai terrorist attacks that happened in 2009. They used GPS, they used web search, they used social media to both plan their attacks and figure out who they were going to assassinate. Technology itself is amoral. It's how we humans choose how to use it that determines whether it's good or bad. Anything we roll out for a good purpose or for our own defense purposes can and probably will be used against us as well. Lastly, artificial intelligence, recognizing I have the fun of only five minutes, so this will be very brief. Um, unlike past industrial revolutions, machine learning can be and it will be probably 100% digital for the most part. And you can make a profit by investing in an algorithm, investing in a machine learning approach that has no additional human jobs and get a return on that investment, again, with no additional human jobs. So for those that say, well, there's always been displacement of jobs, this is different because it's digital. And so I raise that because also at the same time, and I say this, if anyone's an economist in the room, I apologize, most of classical economics is not empirical. Game theory, there's a wonderful paper from 2000 in the American Economic Journal that pegs game theory at being 30% accurate to how humans actually behave. It's a good thing we didn't nuke ourselves during the Cold War is all I can say. That said, globalization as well, they did not tell you that not all boats rise at once. That if you have a strong currency, your country will have to wait until other currencies catch up for your workforce to compete. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. We're at the low tide of globalization in the United States. And jobs matter immensely. American Medical Journal has published numerous studies that show when you actually are unemployed, or even when you retire, if you don't have an advocation or some purpose in your life, your physical health goes down, your family's health goes down, your social contacts go down. We humans, for whatever reason, back when we were with our ancestors, those of our ancestors that had a sense of purpose or needed a sense of purpose were more likely to pass their genes on than those who did not. And so we have to ask this question when we face this possible job crisis, what will happen when we don't need to hire people? What will they start to do? So 
If we're looking at that world, it's going to raise massive questions as well because we need to start thinking about not displacing what people do, but augmenting what people do. And that's going to be hard because a lot of people are going to be looking at, well, wait, it's more productive and more current return on investment if I just do the machine. So we're going to have to think about how do we get that triple bottom line of not just profit, but social good and human health. Uh, in 2013, there was a competition to see if anyone could write an algorithm that would grade papers as good as a third grade teacher. For $60,000, actually a head fund trader on their free time solved that. 2014, Xerox comes out with a copier that will scan a handwritten test, handwritten answers, and grade it for the teacher. 2015, hedge fund elects to its board of directors a machine and gives it voting rights. 2016, there are now competitions going on to see if anyone can rate an AI that will answer real estate law as good as a real estate lawyer. It's right now about 70% accurate. I would not recommend going to any profession that is rote and rule-based because that will probably get displaced. This is an example of Google. Google has already actually done a taste where they took 27 of the top physicians in the world that were experts at identifying glaucoma in the eye. They brought them together and they ended up actually producing a machine that learned from each of them. And the machine, by learning from each of them, actually was better than any one physician alone. So this is the idea of collective intelligence. You can take experts, have the machine learn what they're uniquely looking at, and then get something that's a product of all of them, and it's even better. I would submit right now, if you're doing radiology and you go to a hospital for whatever purpose, you need to have a scan. If it's not one of the top 5% hospitals in the world, you probably do want a machine to look at your x-ray or CAT scan in addition to a human. Thank you. So short term, we're looking for mean machines working along people. We've already done this before with cancer cells. And it's really about the idea that the machine can tell you it's seeing something abnormal, but it can't tell you why. We don't teach a five-year-old to speak saying subject, verb, object. We teach a five-year-old to be exposing them to enough language, so eventually they say, I'm going to run to school today, as opposed to, to school today I'm going to run, which sounds awkward. And when you ask them why, they'll simply say, I never heard it said that way before. So that's the same thing we need to think about going forward. Now, algorithms make mistakes. Uh, we know that if we add noises to image, this happens with Google, you can try it yourself, it'll get it catastrophically wrong. It'll think a teapot instead is biology, or a property is an ecosystem. Similarly, just last week, there were stories that Gillette was actually mailing out to people that were not male. They were mailing them out, congratulations, you're 18, here's your first razor. In several cases, they were not 18 or they were not male. So the machine obviously was queuing into wrong data in some cases. So we need to think about how we solve that. So we're looking by 2040, increased productivity. But the question is, what is the role of humans at that point in time? So I will now try and wrap up to lead to the panel with asking six questions. First, what is an act of war in 2040 if humans are no longer organizing primarily by nation states? Second, where are boundaries in a conflict? How do you identify an algorithm as being a friend or foe? How do you know if an AI is a friend or foe? If humans no longer need to work, what will they do with their time? How will societies respond to their shift? And will this be a peaceful transition or not? If super-empowered individuals assaults a group of individuals, is that a law enforcement or a defense issue? If it's an individual of one, is that still an act of war? Or is it a criminal issue? At the same time, if an internet-enabled car or device is compromised and digitally attacks a bank, who helps fix that? Who's going to let your family member know that maybe their refrigerator is attacking J.P. Morgan? And it's not even something they did. And then finally, if a tailored virus is released with negative consequences on a specific segment of the human population, is that a hate crime, act of war, something else? Your innovative spirit is needed now. Who knows who this is a photo of? Graham? Yes, thanks for representing. This is Ensign Nimitz back in 1904. He ran his boat aground, USS Decatur. He was court-martialed but not drummed out of the Navy. As we know, 35 years later became one of only two five-star admirals we ever had, helping us win the war in the Pacific. Now, it's worth recognizing that because what if the same thing had happened nowadays? How long on Twitter and Facebook would have been fire Nimitz? How many news and comedian pundits would have been, how could he have possibly done that? 
and probably he and his boss and his boss's boss would be called before Congress and it would have been out. In fact, it actually is naval reg. You run a boat aground just once, you're automatically out. I'll end you with two hopeful notes before we go to our panel. First, supposedly when the Constitution was signed, Ben Franklin is rumored to have said he could rest easy knowing the great American experiment will continue to exist for the next 50 years. Now, that was 240 years ago. So we may be due for some new experiments. But he used the word experiment. And experiment and expertise both had the word expert, which is Greek for out of danger. That the only way you get expertise is you do dangerous things, which are experiments, by definition, because they don't always work out. So the question is, where are the safe spaces for us in public service in national security to do experiments that may not work out? When the Corona Project was done, it took 13 tries before it finally lifted off, let alone actually captured images. The rocket blew up 13 different times. How long could we do that here nowadays before the Congress or someone would have canceled the project because they weren't convinced it was going to succeed? This is again a picture of space. This is our planet in 2013 when Cassini passed Saturn. And Carl Sagan said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. Everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. We're going to need more change agents for exponential times. And with that, I'll invite the panelists to come and join. <laughs>